Greetings to all of you. I am Carol Puckett, a food safety consultant with BDH. I will be one of three presenters discussing the role of the environmental health specialist in a shelter. To facilitate this training, you should have downloaded two forms. The environmental health assessment form for disaster shelters during COVID-19 and the environmental health assessment guide. We'll be using these forms during this portion of the presentation. My email address and phone number is provided here if you would like to contact me later with any additional questions. So let's begin our discussion regarding the environmental health role associated with shelters. After extreme events, it may be challenging to carry out the traditional functions of an environmental health. We must be able to anticipate, recognize, and respond to many issues involving conducting environmental assessments, communicating with the public, and supporting the recovery after the emergency. Environmental health roles and responsibilities in an emergency or disaster generally will be associated with one or more of the following. Safe and healthy building environments, the safety and health of shelter occupants, safe food and water, proper solid and liquid waste management and disposal, including laundry management, and effective vector control and pest management. All of these environmental concerns are interconnected. For example, food safety is affected by the water supply used to clean and cook the food. Likewise, waste management and disposal impacts the breeding and behavior of certain pests and vectors. The CDC has developed an environmental health assessment form for disaster shelters during COVID-19. The purpose of the form is to assist environmental health practitioners in conducting a rapid assessment of shelter conditions during emergencies and disasters. This new form also provides in-depth steps on how to prevent COVID-19 in general population shelters. The tool is an assessment form that covers eight general areas of environmental health as well as some other shelter management responsibilities. It also allows for the documentation of immediate needs in the shelters. CDC has also developed a guide for the environmental health assessment for disaster shelters during COVID-19. It is the what and how for each of the assessment areas. Both the CDC assessment form and the guide will be found in PDF form in the VDH Emergency Response Mass Care Plan, Annex H for Health and Medical. So let's look at how to use the CDC Environmental Health Assessment Form for Disaster Shelters. Column one is for identification of the assessing agency, the assessor, and contact information. Later, after your assessment has been completed, you will indicate if any immediate needs are identified. These needs should be discussed with the shelter manager. Column two identifies shelter type, date, reasons for the assessment, location, address, contact information, and resident data. This information can also be obtained from the shelter manager. Column three is for occupant intake and processing specific to COVID-19. Other shelter management personnel will be performing this assessment. Environmental health can identify that this performance was successful. Look at columns four through 11 on the assessment form. Columns four through 11 depicts areas that environmental health will be assessing. Basically, this is the facility, food, drink, health and medical, sanitation, solid waste, child care if provided, and the sleeping areas. The Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services will utilize column 12. The shelter manager will utilize the column 13. Comments will then be assessed. Column 14 will be used for general comments or notes on any section. Column 15 should be used to list any identified critical needs, including the respective item number from the form. So the shelter opens, 
what do I do? Let's explore columns four through 11, starting with the column four labeled as facility. Here are pictures from a state shelter facility in Williamsburg. The shelter facility itself should be evaluated before and during its opening. And these are the areas of assessment for the shelter facility itself. Shelter facility standards should have been addressed during the planning phase before the emergency event. In most cases, environmental health specialists will be merely verifying these minimum standards. We will look at items 32 through 46, starting with structural damage. With structural damage, note any significant damage to the physical structure. Look at the roofs, windows, and walls. Security guards or police should be available on the premises. For security reasons, there should be a shelter check-in system. With the HVAC system operational, you want to ask yourself the question, do you have heat or air conditioning? Will you be in a good position if the power goes out? The facility should also be well ventilated, free of air hazards, smoke, fumes, etc. And if possible, shelter planning should ensure that the disaster shelters are located in buildings with high ventilation capacity similar to healthcare facilities. Shelters should be equipped with air exchange systems. The shelter should be located in buildings with tall ceilings. And if possible, utilize the highest efficiency shelters filters that are compatible with the shelter's existing HVAC system. You want to adopt clean to dirty directional airflows and select upward airflow rotation if using ceiling fans. Now with reference to adequate space per person, it depends on the classification of the shelter. There are increased space requirements for mitigation for COVID-19. As a result, evacuation shelters should have 60 square foot per person. In most cases, this is what you will be dealing with. General shelters should have 110 square foot per person. These shelters are usually permanent long-term situations like homeless shelters. And finally, medical shelters are typically set up for special needs residents. You should follow local guidelines for state for space requirements when it comes to medical shelters. Shelters should be free of injury and occupational hazards. For example, they should be free of frayed or exposed electrical wires. There should be no carbon monoxide hazard, no unnecessary hazardous materials, free of clutter in the stairwells and hallways, and free of slip, trip, or fall hazards. Shelters should also be free of pests and other vectors. You should note any presence of mosquitoes, fleas, flies, roaches, and or rodents. The premises should be free of evidence of pests, such as gnaw marks, urine, and droppings. With reference to municipal power, it should be operational. Are the lights on? Is there any evidence of any kind of electrical overload? There should be working electrical generator on premises. You should assess for appropriate location, sufficient capacity, adequate fuel, and adequate ventilation. If yes, you want to indicate what type it is. Is it gas, diesel, solar, or some other source type? A backup power source should also be available apart from the first generator. And if yes, please identify the source. There should be an adequate number of electrical outlets for each person who needs to plug in electrical devices, including medical equipment. The indoor temperature is next on the assessment. A temperature measurement should be taken from a random location inside the facility. The American Society of Chemical Engineers sets a standard for temperature inside buildings. From May 15th to October 1st, the recommended range is 75 to 80.5 degrees Fahrenheit. For October 2nd to May 14th, it is 68.5 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Basically, what you want to know is, is it comfortable inside the building? 
And then finally, fire safety is a function of the local fire marshal's office and fire officials will be assessing the shelter facility before and during its opening. The environmental health specialist should also observe the availability of carbon dioxide detectors, smoke detectors, sprinklers, fire alarms, and fire extinguishers. The fire safety equipment should be in good working order and the fire extinguisher should not be expired and it should be full. Now let's look at shelter facility considerations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Individuals housed in shelters share living spaces and sanitary facilities and may be exposed to crowded conditions. Emergency managers, shelter coordinators or managers, and public health professionals should understand the risk of introduction and subsequent transmission of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases in these settings. For this reason, the local health district, including environmental health, should be involved in the facility shelter planning. Alternatives to opening disaster shelters, such as sheltering in place, should be considered during the COVID-19 pandemic. Hotel dormitories and small shelters with fewer than 50 residents should be prioritized over larger shelters. Large congregate shelters should be a last resort. Finally, officials should demobilize large congregate shelters as soon as possible after the emergency phase and relocate residents to hotels or dormitories or even small shelters for better physical distancing. If a disaster shelter must be open during COVID-19, physical distancing is a priority. When possible, place groups or families in individual rooms or in separate areas of the facility. The shelter facility should be large enough to provide space for distancing among residents. Provide a distance of at least six feet between cots of people from different households and have residents sleep head to toe. To promote best practices, the environmental health specialist should work with the shelter management to ensure that appropriate signage has been posted throughout the facility. The signage will emphasize common symptoms of COVID-19, the importance of wearing a cloth face covering, the need to follow frequent hand washing and proper respiratory etiquette, any kind of signage for reporting symptoms to the shelter staff if they feel ill, and reminding staff to wash their hands with soap and water after touching somebody who is sick or handling a sick person's personal effects using tissues or laundry. There may also be signage that's associated with coping with stress. Now for a knowledge check. Which of the following areas are EHS responsible for? Food, water, laundry, mass vaccination, waste water, solid waste, traffic and parking security, crowd management, and shelter layout. I'll give you a few minutes to um, determine what your final answer should be. And the answer is, food, water, wastewater, laundry, and solid waste. Now let's discuss shelter food. Disasters are often followed by hunger. One of the earliest response tasks at the shelter is to ensure sufficient water that is safe to eat. Various food safety methods must be used to ensure that food is from a food source, the food must be protected from spoilage and contamination. Food equipment should also be protected. And both food and food equipment should be handled so as to prevent cross-contamination. Additionally, good personal hygiene practices should be utilized by food handlers and shelter participants. And time and temperature requirements should be met for cooking, reheating, cooling, cold holding, and hot holding of TCS foods to prevent foodborne illness. Assessments of the shelter food facility involve the same risk factors that environmental health specialists employ every day in risk-based inspections of food facilities. 
Our food safety goals are to reduce the risk of foodborne illness, to prevent the transmission of COVID-19, to intervene and ensure that corrective action is taken when food safety may be compromised, to work with food operators to provide safe, sound, and honestly presented food, and to educate the public and volunteers regarding food safety before, during, and after an emergency or disaster. Special considerations are required for mass feeding operations. It's often necessary to feed large numbers of responders and the affected public. Mass feeding operations are frequently managed by non-government organizations or NGOs, such as the American Red Cross or vendors from outside the state. Food may be prepared in a variety of locations. Correctional facilities, schools, or other institutions may be used to prepare feed, food for mass feeding. Fixed or permanent locations already regulated by the Virginia Department of Health are a good option for mass food production. They are already authorized food as preparation establishments and to serve large numbers of people. Mobile kitchens, however, offer the flexibility of moving to various locations and are self-sufficient with power generators and water supplies. They also can produce large quantities of food. Environmental health specialists must work closely with these operators to ensure that food is procured, stored, handled, prepared, and served safely. Environmental health responders, when possible, should assess mass feeding sites before they become operational. There is a list here to consider during pre-operational assessments of the food facility. You should review mass feeding plans with the food vendor. Look at low risk versus complex food processes. Look at specific menu items for red flags involving critical control points to prevent foodborne illness. And ascertain that there are approved food suppliers. Then discuss potential safety or health risks with the food managers at the site. What else do we look for? Proper food preparation, service, and disposal plan. Do they have a standard operating procedure? Is there a food service schedule? You need to know the when, where, how in order to plan and perform your environmental health assessment. Is there a trained staff or a volunteer being utilized. Offer food safety training to staff members and volunteers if needed before the feeding operations begin. Is there a certified food protection manager? Is there an adequate supply of potable water? And is there a proper sewage and solid waste disposal in place? You'll want to know if there are any plans for vector control and pest management. Do they have plans for disrupting uh, utilities such as generators, bottled water, and or sewage containment ladders? Are hand washing facilities available for the food vendors and shelter participants? And will there be appropriate glove use? Many problems can be avoided by ensuring that the kitchen facility is designed properly. That being said, keep in mind that this facility is essentially a temporary food establishment and that shelter participants have nowhere else to go for food. You do not want to create a disaster within a disaster by attempting to close the food facility. Help the food operator find ways to be successful. Discuss unresolved food safety concerns with the incident safety officer. An environmental health specialist should have proper equipment for good working order when conducting food safety activities. The environmental health specialist should have an approved food temperature measuring device such as a thermocouple thermometer, approved alcohol swabs, sanitizing measurement devices, and temperature strips or a digital maximizing temperature recording device. The environmental specialist should have a flashlight, disposable glove, hand washing reminder sign, 
any inspection forms and educational brochures as per the district policy and as an option, a camera. Best practice is to utilize a standardized environmental health specialist to perform food inspections with this equipment. Due to limited manpower resources, however, other environmental health specialists may be asked to fill this role. If this is the case, it's strongly recommended that the EHS is supervised by a district standardization officer. Now let's look at the food facility in terms of the actual operational assessment. At the onset, we want a reputable food vendor who demonstrates knowledge of food safety. Preparation should occur on site. Food should be served on the site. Check the source of the food. Usually there is a contractual agreement with a supplier who's inspected by the regulatory authority. There should be no donated food received from the public because there have been foodborne illnesses associated with donated food that was given to emergency workers in the public. Do not go there. An adequate food supply will depend initially on a number of days to project in the event itself. Usually there will be a backup supplier from outside the affected area or the ICS team may elect to contact the State Emergency Operations Center. There should be a minimum of three meals per day for all shelter residents. There should also be appropriate storage as per your Virginia food regulations and FDA food code. You should evaluate for appropriate temperatures as stated for critical control points in accordance with the Virginia food regulations and the FDA food code. Record your temperatures in the comment section. The hand washing facilities may be fixed or portable as long as they are operational for food handlers and shelter occupants. The facility should be provided with hand washing stations and soap with disposable towels or alcohol-based hand sanitizer with a minimum of 60% alcohol for use prior to entering food lines. They may position shelter staff at hand washing stations to promote proper hand washing and to monitor for signs of illness. All staff should wear cloth face coverings. Safe food handling should be occurring in accordance with the Virginia Food Regulations and the FDA Food Code. Keep the FDA risk factors and the interventions in mind. Dishwashing facilities should be available. There should be a place to wash, rinse, and sanitize all utensils and food equipment as required. And a clean kitchen area is also necessary. Finally, the last three criteria are new assessment areas as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Food workers are required to wear clean masks. There should be a roster of food workers kept in a secure area on site. And meal times should be staggered and arranged to allow a distance of six feet between different households. Here are, we have listed the shelter food considerations during the COVID-19 pandemic. BDH strongly encourages serving prepackaged meals or individual meals dispensed by food service workers when possible. Cafeteria style service is preferred over self-service, buffet, or family style service. However, self-service options may be provided with physical distancing if necessary. Pursuant to Executive Order 67, facilities must provide hand sanitizer at food lines and require the use of barriers such as gloves or deli paper when employees or patrons touch common utensils. Food lines must be monitored by trained staff at all times of operation and serving utensils must be changed hourly. Staff should be wearing cloth face coverings here too. Food should be served using disposable silverware cups and plates if available. If these items are not disposable, the food contact surfaces should be protected from contamination and cleaned and disinfected after each use. And finally, there should be a roster of food employees. 
Food service workers should wear gloves as appropriate and face coverings during meal preparation and service. These face coverings should always be worn in customer facing areas. There should be enough masks for each worker for each shift and for replacement as needed, since masks may become wet or dirty during a work shift. Residents should wear cloth face coverings while in the food lines and until ready to eat or drink. Maintain a minimum of six feet of distance between the households. Maintain a minimum of six feet of distance between people of different households at meal times using increased table spacing and staggered meal time. Clean and disinfect common areas between meal service times. Encourage staff and shelf residents to not share dishes, drinking glasses, cups, or eating utensils with other people. You may also want to implement illness screening, including fever monitoring of residents entering the food distribution area. This may not be necessary if the shelter management is routinely monitoring for illness. In general, let's do another knowledge check. So the question is a true false question. And basically it states, in general, shelters must discard donations of cooked foods from the public and not serve them to shelter residents because of the food preparation methods and standards of outside sources or unknown. Give you a few minutes to digest that. And then finally, the answer to this would of course be true. Now let's look at Section 7, Health and Medical. There is new criteria for health and medical specific to COVID-19. Most of this criteria is the responsibility of the nursing team in coordination with shelter management. Environmental health will be responsible for criteria number 72 and 86 only. Again, environmental health staff should promote face coverings and frequent hand washing to stop the spread of COVID-19. The environmental health staff works with the nursing team to prevent and mitigate conditions that should facilitate human illness and outbreaks. Environmental health will be responsible for and will be especially concerned about foodborne illness investigations. We want to ensure that foodborne illness and injuries do not occur and food safety concerns are addressed. This is accomplished by interviews with the food vendor and investigations of any food related complaints that may be reported. Additionally, environmental health staff should discuss the food service delivery to ill occupants and staff in any isolation areas with the food vendor. Check with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services if animal shelters are established. The objective is to prevent exposures for rabies and animal disease transmission to humans. And check in with the incident safety officer during your visit for a briefing as to current events. You may also consult with your epidemiology division when necessary to head off any developing problems. Shelter facility managers should also maintain contact with state and local public health agencies and emergency management for any updates on local COVID-19 information. You should be aware of these updates. So at this point, I would like you to please view both the ODW, Office of Drinking Water video, and part two of the environmental health role in the shelter for these portions on the form. Hello, my name is Scott Vogel. I'm currently the Environmental Health Coordinator for the Private Well Program. If you ever have any questions about wells and private drinking water supplies, feel free to contact me. But why am I here today? Um, I started working with VDH in 2001, and I worked for about 13 years as an environmental health specialist or EH supervisor in both the on-site program and the program. Um, in that time, I've had a lot of 
um, other duties as assigned as everybody gets, and um, that included many um, public health emergencies and, and drills. Okay, I can't uh, forward. <laughs> Can you restart that? Hello, my name is Scott Vogel. I'm currently the Environmental Health Coordinator, for the Private Well Program, the Office of Environmental Health Services. Um, if you ever, ever ever have any questions about wells or private drinking water supplies, feel free to contact me. Um, but why am I here today? I started working for VDH in 2001, and I've worked for about 13 years as an environmental health specialist and EH supervisor in the on-site program and the food program. In that time, I've had a lot of other duties as assigned, as, as many of you do, um, that included uh, public health emergencies and drills. So I've, I've gained some experience over the years. In this part of the presentation, I will discuss shelter sanitation as it relates to general cleanliness and cleaning practices, laundry services, and washing stations and bathrooms. I'll also touch on some of the requirements for solid waste disposal and for the sleeping areas in the shelters. At first, it might, may seem like inspecting a shelter is pretty complex and outside of the duties as an environmental health specialist. Um, however, environmental health specialists, they already have the skills. All of the principles they regularly apply in their daily jobs will also apply to shelter operations, inspections. No one else, and I'll emphasize that, no one is better suited to do this job than an environmental health specialist who regularly is out there preventing illnesses already through restaurant inspections, hotel inspections, campgrounds, swimming pools, and all the other programs. <clears throat> The main difference here, though, um, is that environmental health specialists are not there to issue a permit or determine if an establishment is uh, fit to operate. They're there as advisors to use their skills to help the shelter run smoothly and in a sanitary manner. The shelter is a place of last resort for those that are there, and everybody has to work together to make sure the staff and the residents stay healthy and safe. It's for them to go. All right, so the first item on the checklist is laundry facilities. Environmental health specialists can think of these simply as large wear washing or dishwashing machines. The same principle applies as when inspecting a dishwashing in a restaurant, just substituting laundry for, for dishes. The operator has, has to have a machine or machines that is capable of keeping up with the demand in the facility. The machine must, must wash, rinse, and sanitize the laundry. Um, home use machines in most cases aren't going to cut it. The operator must set up the laundry area with specific locations for clean laundry and dirty laundry to keep dirty laundry from cross-contaminating clean laundry and clean services. Gloves should be worn, and in this um, COVID emergency, masks would be appropriate as well. The machines should be able to reach 160 for 30 minutes to sanitize the laundry or bleach can be used as a, at proper concentrations as a sanitizer as well. Many avoid dealing with this component of sanitation by using outside industrial uh, laundry contractors. Look at this picture and consider better ways of conduct conducting an operation. Um, are these towels clean? Are the sheets staying clean, towels and sheets? Um, is it easy to understand what's going on in this picture? Is there enough room for he's working with? Would it be better to be inside versus outdoors? Is the um, person contaminating the, the dirty laundry? Is it contaminating him or is, the, um, is his fair skin contaminating clean laundry? It's hard to tell what's going on here. So. 
again, just using your your uh, environmental health you know, practices, you can think of many ways to do this better, which is going to vary from facility to facility to facility, depending on what they have. But keeping those principles in place of separating dirty dirty from clean, and uh, having a, a good operation available. <clears throat> As with any place where people live or gather, it's critical to make sure there are adequate toilet facilities available and that they are kept clean and operational. Facility plumbed bathrooms are preferred, but commercial privies can also be added as a needed supplement. Contracts should be in place with the providers ahead of time. The privies are delivered before the shelter opens and maintained throughout the operation. The contract should also include the requirements to Regularly, regularly service and clean the privies and uh, deliver new ones if, if they're needed. So there should be some some leeway there to, to add on if for some reason the shelter has to expand. In general, one toilet per 20 people is the requirement. There should be adequate uh, ADA compliant facilities as well in close proximity, proximity to those that might need them. And there also should be bathrooms available to the medical areas if there's a medical area operating in the shelter. By law, there has to be separate facilities for men and women. They need to be well stocked with toilet paper, clean um, and located appropriately. You would not want to put uh, commercial privity, privies where uh, they may be blown over in the winds um, in a storm or you don't want them outside somewhere where they're baking in the direct sunlight, there should be somewhere that they can be um, used and, and um, be fairly comfortable to use. Be sure privies are located far away from any food operations. And um, currently in the, the COVID situations, it's good to have actual separate bathroom facilities if possible, if there is some sort of quarantine or isolation going on in the, the facility to make sure that you're keeping people that may be sick or, or may be exposed um, away from the general population or keeping populations that are, are more, more susceptible to, to illness away from, from other populations that might be carriers. <clears throat> this slide was originally supposed to demonstrate why showers are needed. You can see people are in pretty close, tight quarters for long periods of time. However, this is also a good demonstration of, of why environmental health specialists are the right people with the right skills for the job. The shelter shows a blue tarp. I mean, the, the picture shows a blue tarp covering the ground in the main shelter area. Can you see any reason, any issues with that tarp? Um, or with the location of the cots in this picture. This uh, might just be for exercise purposes when they took this picture. Um, and I, I believe the facility was trying to protect their, their floors from being scratched. But if this was an actual emer emergency where this, this facility was being used, they should remove that tarping. There are other methods that can better protect the floors and also remain um, clean and durable. An average person might not think too much about what's going on here, but an EHS would recognize pretty quickly that the tarp is not durable for all the foot traffic that's going to use it, and it will probably tear and be kicked up easily and be a tripping hazard. And it's also very hard to disinfect something like that. Uh, the tarp is the perfect place for insects to hide between the floor and the tarp itself. And um, of course, the way that cat cots are arranged in this picture. There's not enough space between the cots and people don't have adequate space. We'll, we'll address some of that later on. Again, we're, we're put to, to put into use all of your skills as an environmental health specialist for surfaces that are durable, cleanable, eliminating, eliminating areas for vermin and insects and being, you know, putting the principles of wash, rinse, sand. But back to the showers, um, a shelter needs to provide showers at the rate of one per 15 people, particularly in, it's more important in long-term shelters where people 
you know, are going to be there for a longer period of time and, and need to maintain personal hygiene. As with toilet facility, there needs to be separate showers for, for men and for women. One of the most critical sanitation requirements for a shelter or for any facility is to have abundant hand washing sinks. Although it's preferred to have the actual plumbed sinks, portable hand washing stations can be used to meet the requirements as well. And again, they should be contracted with um, ahead of time and put in place when the shelter opens um, with, with the contracts there to, to um, maintain them and provide them. There should be one hand washing station per 15 people. There should be hot water if hot water is available. The stations need hand towels, soap, and sanitizer. As the very last resort, hand sanitizers can be used um, if there's no water available or if the water's temporarily offline. They also um, they should be put in very accessible locations. And um, this is a great opportunity for UHSs to put out their signs about hand washing, how critical hand washing it is, and proper hand washing technique. As an update for COVID, um, we need to make sure that there, there are proper numbers of, of the, the um, hand washing sinks also in transition areas or in the different area operation areas of the facility. So if people are going from you know, if they're going from the, the bed area to the, the kitchen or the, the eating area, they're going to wash their hands as they, they go back and forth, and um, they're very accessible to use. Also, don't forget, as an environmental health specialist, just as you do in restaurants, be sure you wash your hands so people can see and they know that you're, you're, a, you're a good model of, of um, proper hand washing technique. I've seen a lot of places lately that are doing a really great job with, with hand sanitizers. Again, as, as part of the COVID-19 um, situation that we're in, um, additional hand sa sanitizing stations everywhere would be for is advisable. The more visible, the more present they are, the more likely people will actually use them. Um, it's good to have them by entrances and exits, along hallways, um, in any eating area and food prep areas. And there could just never be too many of these things. Bathrooms and hand washing stations need to be serviced at least daily. Um, for the update for the for COVID-19, it's recommended that every four hours would be a better place. They need to be cleaned and supplied as needed. Dumpsters need to be emptied every three days at least. Um, of course, this may not happen if services and access is, is knocked out by a disaster, but there needs to be a plan in place to make it possible to reestablish those supply lines as quickly as possible. And if supplies can't be established, then a plan for long-term storage and capacity you know, for that should be kind of improvised on site. This goes back to the to earlier part of the presentation that talked about the selection of the design of shelters. Um, shelters should be in protected and accessible areas where critical supplies can make it to them after the danger has passed. As an example, if you think back to the Louisiana Superdome during Katrina, um, it was a minute shelter. A lot of the planning wasn't in place. And um, with all, all the roads, I mean, it was, it was, it's in a bad location because all the access points were, were flooded out to get to it, and it really turned into a horrible situation for the people that were there for a couple of days with no trash pickup and um, no utilities, no air circulation, limited bathrooms and things like that. Facilities need to be cleaned frequently and with more emphasis on disinfection. For example, if you take a shelter that's in a school um, where school's being repurposed, the tendency might be to continue the same cleaning schedule for that school. 
But in reality, the shelter is a place where many more people are sleeping, eating, and living for longer periods of time. Often the shelter may be performing medical functions as well. So the facility needs to be cleaned far, way far and above the typical school requirements. That's what's meant by the hyper cleaning in the first part of this slide. Also, cleaning is often mistakenly left to the least skilled staff, but cleaning should be done by trained individuals. They should be well versed in how to sanitize um, different spills, uh, what concentrations to use with the cleaners and the sanitizers, proper cleaning techniques, and they should be provided with the proper equipment, including masks, gloves, shoes, and clothing. I never realized the nuance and skill to mopping until for, um, a McDonald's roll, roll factory bread factory in Fredericksburg. Um, I was on, on the night crew and we part of what we did was sanitize the floors and stuff like that. There's a lot more to mopping and sanitizing a floor than, than just sticking a bucket, you know, sticking the mop in the bucket and spreading water across the floor. Inspections should be done to make sure supplies are adequate, um, the products are on hand, and if possible, the staff is there to actually test their knowledge on how they're cleaning up spills and things. Currently, the recommendation under COVID-19 is, is to clean high-touch areas every four hours, handrails, doorknobs, countertops, things like that. And also, is uh, if you go to the EPA website, if you look at the, if you Google EPA list and cleaning products, you, or you follow this link here, you can get to the approved cleaning products that, that are you know, tested to, to be sure that they can kill the, co the coronavirus. Bodily fluids. All staff should know how to deal with bodily fluids to prevent pathogens from traveling through the facility. The guidance here is from the CDC website link. You can follow the link on this slide as well. Um, in summary, a person cleaning should be wearing the appropriate barriers like gloves, masks, gowns, and goggles to protect themselves. The area should be cleared of, of any other people that might be close by, any bystanders. Um, bleach can be used as labeled. In general, you should go by the 10 ratio for 5% bleach solution is usually pretty good. Never use hot water with bleach. Um, that, that can can uh, take away its effectiveness. The tried and true each principle of wash, rinse, sanitize applies here. First, you're using the paper towels or, or something, something material to up any organic mess that's there and dispose of, disposing of it in the biohazard bag if you can. Washing and rinsing the area with the mop first, and then, just as important as the rest of it, going back over again with the sanitizing solution and allowing it to air dry. Overall, there are many things to consider as an EHS doing shelter inspections to maximize your effectiveness at preventing communicable diseases. Um, similar to, to priorita prioritizing your day as an EHS, um, between risk assessments and routine inspections in different facilities. You must also consider the size of the shelters, the number of shelters that you might have to inspect, um, the scope of the area affected, the anticipated length of the stays people will be staying at the shelter for the type of disaster um, that's there. All these things are factors to, to kind of consider you know, how much time how are you best serving the, the, the residents of these facilities? How much time do you have to conduct each inspection? Do you only have time to go in to, to do like some of the critical things and then maybe come back later on and hit as many shelters as you can if you're in an area where there's, there's a bunch of them that you need to get to. Also, of course, keeping in mind that you've got yourself and your, your family to, to consider too, and keeping yourself out of harm's way. Um, think about what time of day you want to do your inspections to, you know, for example, if you wish to, to, to do an inspection relating to food operations, of course, you want to be there around mealtime. 
if you want to inspect the sleeping area and sleeping conditions, you might be there later at night. Or um, if, if you're looking at their cleaning processes and stuff later at night, might be a better time to do the inspection for early in the morning. Um, now with the COVID um, emergency, it's probably a good idea to, to try to get back to these facilities and make sure that they're keeping up with the, the COVID um, guidelines for, for the shelter. The biggest point of, of the shelter inspection is to put EHS to use um, the best way possible, keep people safe. Because it's an emergency situation, you can't revoke a permit like you might for a restaurant where there's an imminent health threat. However, um, you can help the facility manager and staff make changes and come up with solutions to the problems that you see. Discuss the, discuss the inspections with the manager, consider getting a signature on the inspection form, Remember that there may be more than one manager handling different aspects. Um, you're the public, you're, you're the environmental health specialist, you're the expert. Um, help them implement sound methods and techniques. And in some cases, you might have to improvise where there are things that aren't available or, or situations where there's, you know, you're not gonna have, not gonna be able to correct them right away. For example, if there aren't enough hand washing sinks available, consider like, with coolers where you can still wash their hands to some extent, at least better than if there was nothing there, and then um, use sanitizer and stuff like that as well. Um, consider environmental health specialists. Our main duty is typically education, so that's going to be a big part of this, and take the opportunity while you're there to educate staff and, and um, residents about public health. In a way, you've got a captive audience there who might be bored and they're ready to listen to you. This is a good opportunity to hand out all your great environmental health literature, put up signs and posters, um, coloring books. We, we had some coloring books, books for the Marina program that you know the kids would, would love to read through. Um, key things to consider here is to have pamphlets and that deal with cleanup and recovery after folks will leave the shelter. Um, they might have many questions about um, septic systems and wells that are flooded, how to, to disinfect drinking water and how to deal with mold and flooding and um, why not to, to wade through floodwaters, things like that. It's good to have these things on hand at your district just in, in case, you know, ahead of time in, the, in case something should come up like, like a public health emergency. Knowledge check time. What is the number one most effective way to prevent the spread of disease in a shelter? Hand washing, of course, and now mask use. We'd add that to the list with the COVID-19 emergency that we're in. True or false, the number of sinks, toilets, beds in a shelter determine the number of people that it can serve. The answer to this one is false because um, this is the kind of things that we're dealing with. Earth, you know, earthquakes, floods, whatever, whatever's going on, hurricanes, tornadoes. Shelter is going to be better than whatever the situation is that the people are fleeing. So again, we're not there to to turn anybody out. We're there, the shelters are there to protect people, keep people safe, um, hopefully, and keep them healthy. Well, the um, emergency happens, and then for a period of time afterwards for the recovery. True or false, to clean up bodily fluids, add one cup of bleach to one gallon of hot water and mop up the fluid. And again, that is false. No hot water with bleach. You would want to be moving it according to the label because there's different uh, concentrations of bleach out there and follow the CDC guidelines on cleaning up bodily fluids. You have any questions about the previous or following 
slides, you can email this email address here, or my email address is Scott M. Don't forget the M as in Mike. Dot Vogel at VDH dot Virginia dot gov. People, including those at shelters, especially where there's there's lots of prepackaged items and foods and things, they generate amazing amounts of solid waste. So it's very important to make sure that shelters have systems in place to collect, store, and eliminate waste. Trash is a, a nuisance. It can be a hazard with the medical waste. It can be toxic with other chemicals and things. And it's definitely a food source for rats and insects and other vectors. There should be a 30 gallon trash can for every 10 residents. Those containers need to be cleaned regularly and removed um, to, to um, adequately size dumpsters or, or multiple dumpsters. Medical infectious and infectious waste needs to be handled separately and labeled as medical waste. Needles, called sharps, need to be in sharp containers to make sure that they can be stabbed by those needles when they're disposing of it. Hazardous waste, such as batteries, light bulbs, oil, chemicals, they also need to be labeled and disposed of properly. Dumpsters need to be covered and kept away from food prep, prep areas and common areas. Of course, none of that matters, again, unless it's being collected and removed periodically, um, with the exception of a temporary disturbances that might have might occur during the disaster, the facility should have contracts in place to um, restore the garbage removal as quickly as possible, have adequate dumpsters on site, and um, have those emptied as often as possible to make sure not, no trash is, is being accumulated at least once every three days. If there's some sort of interruption in the, the supply line or you know, the, the trash collection, then there should be a, a way of improvising sort of long, longer term storage of that trash to make sure it doesn't pile up in the living areas or, or the food prep areas or anything like that. And it's kept, kept away and safe. Which of the following are critical component, components of shelter assessment tools? And this would be all of them, of course, the food service is critical, sanitary facilities, having access to them. Housekeeping is critical, laundry facilities, if the, the place has laundry facilities, and um, drinking or safe water. <clears throat> A shelter is developed to accommodate 1,000 residents. What are the bathroom, hand washing, shower, and laundry requirements? Bathrooms should be one per 20. So 1,000 divided by 20 gives you 50. Hand washing stations, 67, and 67 for the shower facilities. And uh, the laundry requirements are, again, as there, you need to have facilities adequate to, to, um, to deal with however much is going on at that facility or contract out. You can see that that it's critical to have these facilities available and they can add up really quickly for, for even a population of a thousand residents. Child care areas um, only address these if they're provided by the shelter. They're not necessarily required in, in a lot of the short term facilities. They're more common in, in shelters where residents are recovering from the disaster, where they, um, they may be actually returning to work and, and need daycare while they're working during the day. Um, you'll need to look at the diaper changing facilities, facilities, make sure there's soap, towels, water is supplied, cleaned with non-toxic approved disinfectants. 
again, using your skills as an environmental health specialist, you can look at the method, you look at the methods that are being used, wash, rinsing, and sanitizing, contact services and toys and items um, when they're washing their hands after changing diapers and things like that, and before food preparation, making sure bottles and uh, food surfaces are, are sanitized. This is the, the chart for the um, child to caregiver ratio for the different age groups here. Just as in uh, earlier slides, the recommendation during the COVID emergency is to, to make sure that child care areas are cleaned every four hours, um, toys, play mats, all surfaces are disinfected, and um, only safe toys that can be disinfected easily should be used. You no know, stuffed animals and things that, that can't be really cleaned easily. Here are different pictures of sleeping areas in two different shelters. The one on the right is, the, of course, the better example of adequate spacing pre-COVID. We're talking with, with this. Cots are off the floor. The floor is easily cleanable and very durable. The cots should be spaced apart, but often families will move the cots together. That's okay for, for them to do it themselves and move themselves closer, as long as the overall shelter still has the capacity the number of people that are there. Again, there should be an adequate number of cots, beds, or mats. Mats are not preferred. It's better to have some sort of bed or cot uh, for the population. There shouldn't be any sharing of any of the, the bedding materials or the cots. And the, there should be, an, um, again, the, the laundry services or, or some some way of, of making sure that the bedding is is washable and to be changed out regularly for general shelters um, two and a half to three feet between cots is recommended and basically that's about 40 square feet overall per person so roughly that's like a six and a half by six and a half foot area the longer people are expected to be at the shelter, the more area should be allowed. So gradually, if you look at this, the, uh, the CDC guidelines, there's a gradual increase in the number of, of um, in the, the actual square footage for, for each resident that should be provided. So with the COVID situation that's going on, of course, we wanna maintain six feet apart now. Um, they are. They do recommend trying to, to place barriers between um, the sleeping areas or or even each cot, if possible. Hopefully, something that's non-porous and and can be clean and disinfected between use. Again, it, it's okay to move families closer, but it should be considered, you know, that that even families might need to 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 quarantine or isolate and you know, stay away from each other. There should be separate facilities for people that 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 have been exposed to COVID or, or um, have the symptoms where they can be uh, isolated from the rest of the population. And one of the new things, I'm not sure if it's related to, to COVID this year, but cribs for infants, there should be cribs provided for infants that 100% makes sense. I don't know why that wasn't required before, or at least it wasn't um, evident in the inspection form, but babies need to have a safe um, they can't just sleep in cots. They need a safe place to be as well. Sleep. So I, I created this chart to show you kind of with the, the new recommendations of the social distancing with the sleeping areas. You can see under the normal, under the old rules, you've got about two and a half to three foot separation between cots. And then now with the six foot separation distance, it is almost a three times larger area. Um, so this will drastically re reduce shelter capacities across the state. So it's just something that's gonna have to be built into to the shelters. The shelters that, that used to accommodate a thousand people 
might only accommodate one third of that now, depending on how the, the shelter is laid out and how you can separate the different areas. <clears throat> we, we've ran into this problem with, with training recently as well. We, we um, started up the on-site training program with, with some classroom instruction and finding a big enough room, even just for 10 people, can be difficult you know, when you're dealing with the six foot separation area. That, uh, that concludes my presentation. Feel free to contact me again if you have any questions about this or, or the private well program or on-site sewage systems. Um, <clears throat> my email is scottm.vogel at vdh.virginia.gov. Thank you very much and thanks for all the critical work that you guys do out there every day. Thank you. In five, oh my gosh. Wow, I said it. Welcome to the drinking water portion of the shelter and COVID update. My name is Holly Brown. I'm the emergency services coordinator for the Virginia Department of Health Office of Drinking Water. And today I'm gonna to be discussing with you some water considerations regarding state coordinated sheltering sites. Um, as environmental health responders, it's important to, when possible, assess mass feeding sites before they become operational. Um, Reviewing mass feeding plans and discussing potential safety and health risks with the managers of those sites can be very beneficial. Um, you can also offer food safety training to staff members and volunteers if needed before feeding operations begin. Many problems can be avoided by ensuring that the kitchen facility is designed to ensure proper food preparation, storage, and service, and has an adequate supply of potable water, and that staff and volunteers are properly trained. Specifically when it comes to water, the following considerations are important. Whether there's an adequate drinking water supply, what source the drinking water comes from because this can affect availability and possible contaminants, adequate level of residual free chlorine, adequate ice supply, whether or not the water system is operational, whether or not there's a safe ice source, and whether or not hot water is available. Types of things that can affect water availability are drinking water advisories, and these you may run into, especially in an emergency situation. The three most common types that you're going to experience are boil water advisories, do not drink advisories, and do not use advisories. And these vary in terms of their significance and their impacts on the availability of drinking water. Keep in mind that emergency sheltering facilities, um, participants have nowhere else to go for food and water. Um, Discussing unresolved food safety concerns will help the food operator to be successful in providing safe food and water for, for shelter participants. The first type of drinking water advisory is a boil water advisory. This requires that water be boiled first before drinking. It is the most common type of advisory and ensuring that there's adequate availability of water boiling facilities or bottled water as a backup can be important to a shelter's success. Boiling kills bacteria and other organisms that exist in the water and it's the preferred method to ensure that tap water is safe to drink. Bring all tap water to a rolling boil, let it sit for two minutes and let it cool before using or use bottled water. The second type of drinking water advisory is a do not drink advisory. Under these circumstances, boiling water will not allow the water to be safe for drinking use. Um, it should not be used for drinking, making ice, brushing teeth, washing dishes, or preparing food until further notice. The most rare type of advisory is a do not use advisory. If this advisory is issued, you should not use the water for drinking, making ice, brushing teeth, washing dishes, washing clothes, bathing, showering, food preparation, or toilet flushing. Bottled water should be used for all of the above until further notice. These are the most common considerations for water in a shelter setting. If you have questions, you can reach out to the email address below or contact me directly using the information at the beginning of this presentation. And for additional resources, you can view these links.